Hello, and welcome back to another video on legends and myths. Today I'll be telling you the story of the famous Aachen trickster god Anansi, the spider. Anansi, the spider, is one of the most popular animal tricksters from West African mythology. He is often seen taking the shape of a spider and is considered to be the god of all knowledge of stories. He is also one of the most important characters of West African and Caribbean folktale and is famously known for his storytelling. The tales of Anansi are believed to have originated in the Ashanti people in Ghana. The word Anansi is Akan and means simply spider. They later spread to other Akan groups and then to the West Indies, Suriname and the Netherlands Antilles. In Curacao, Aruba and Bonaire, he is known as Nanzi and his wife as She Maria. He is also known as Asanse, Kwaku Ananse, Anansi, and in the southern U.S., Aunt Nancy. In some traditions, Anansi is believed to be responsible for creating the sun, the stars, and the moon, as well as teaching mankind the techniques of agriculture. Anansi shares similarities with the trickster figure of Br'er Rabbit, who originated from the folklore of the Bantu-speaking peoples of South and Central Africa. Although Anansi may be depicted as a human, his normal form is a spider, and also, according to the Asante people who are part of the larger Akin culture in Western Africa, Anansi can be a trickster that is, a personality who teaches moral, ethical, political, or social values based on his ability to lead a person to the truth through example, puzzles, and the least expected turns and twists of fate. In mythology and the study of folklore and religion, a trickster is a character in a story, god, goddess, spirit, human or anthropomorphization, who exhibits a great degree of intellect or secret knowledge and uses it to play tricks or otherwise disobey normal rules and defy conventional behavior. The trickster archetype is a character who represents disruption, mischief, and humor. Tricksters are often portrayed as cunning, witty, humorous, and unpredictable figures who challenge the status quo and cause unexpected events in our stories. Among many stories attached to Anansi and collected literature, one explains how he became known as the owner of all stories in the world. It is so popular that it has been studied and republished alongside other stories many times, including as children's books. This tale was about how the Sky God stories came to be Anansi stories, which this version of the most commonly retold folktale was recorded by Rattray in his book on Akin Ashanti folktales. Now, as the tale generally goes, there were no stories in the world, as they were all held by the Sky God Nyami. Anansi wanted Nyami's stories and asked him to give them to him, but Nyami did not want to give up his stories, even though the spider insisted he could afford to pay for them. Unconvinced, Nayami then told Anansi that many great kingdoms like Kokofu, Bekwai, and Asumengya tried to buy the stories from him, yet could not afford them. He then pondered how Anansi, completely insignificant in comparison, would succeed where they had failed. Anansi, however, was not intimidated and promised he could afford them, asking Nayami their price. As a result, Nayami entertained Anansi's offer, but nonetheless set a high price hoping that it would be impossible for Anansi to accomplish the difficult labors that he devised for him. Anansi had to capture four of the most dangerous creatures in the world, which were the Python Onini, Hornets Moboro, Leopard Osebo, and Fairy Moatia. Undaunted, the clever Anansi promised to bring Nayame those four things and even added his own mother Yansia for extra measure. Nayami accepted his offer and advised him to begin his journey, so Anansi set about putting his schemes into motion. First, Anansi went to his family and told them about his plan, including Yan Sia. Then, he asked his wife ASO for advice, as he wished to capture Onini the python first. ASO advised him to cut a branch from a palm tree and gather some string creeper vines. Anansi returned with them, and also told him to take them to the river where Onini lived nearby, pretending to argue with her to draw the python's attention. Anansi agreed with her plan and took them. He then pretended to debate with her in an imaginary argument over the length of Onini's body while he headed there, 
pretending ASO had claimed Onini's body was longer than the branch of a full-grown palm tree. Onini eventually heard Anansi pretending to argue with ASO, so he approached the spider and asked Anansi what he was talking about. Anansi explained, and Onini, unaware of Anansi's trickery, quickly agreed to help Anansi prove that he was longer than a palm tree branch. Thus, Anansi told the python to stretch himself beside the branch Anansi had gathered, which Onini then did so eagerly, unaware he had fallen into a trap. Anansi then took the string creeper vines he had gathered and tied up Onini completely. Anansi then lost no time in carrying Onini off to Nayami, mocking the python along the way and informing him of his bargain with Nayame. Triumphant, Anansi soon arrived and presented Onini to Nayami, which the Sky God acknowledged Anansi's accomplishment, but reminded him that he still had other challenges, imagining in secret that Anansi would fail. After the spider completed his quest on capturing Onini the python, Anansi returned home to ASO and informed her of what he accomplished, which he then decided to capture the Moboro hornets next. He asked her for advice, and his wife obliged, telling him to find a gourd and fill it with water. The spider then carried the gourd along with him to see the hornets. Anansi followed her advice, heading towards the bush where the hornets roamed in search of them. Soon, the spider noticed a swarm of hornets loitering near one, and he crept close to them, readying his gourd. Anansi then sprinkled some of his water at the Moboro hornets, careful to save some for himself. The spider then doused himself with the remaining water he had collected and cut a leaf from a banana tree nearby, covering his head with it. Soon the hornets flew to him in a fit, but Anansi showed them his banana leaf, still wet, and explained that it had been raining. The clever Anansi then warned the hornets that the rain was dangerous, suggesting that they could enter his gourd so they would not be overcome. The hornets agreed and thanked Anansi for helping them, unaware of his scheme, and they all flew inside filling the gourd as they sought the shelter Anansi had promised them. Once all of them had entered, Anansi stopped the mouth of the gourd and taunted them for succumbing to his scheme. The spider told them of his plan to trade them to the Sky God for his stories, which he then took the hornets to Nayame. Nayami accepted the hornets, but reminded Anansi that he still had other tasks left in spite of his successes so far, certain the spider still could not complete the task. He bade the spider to continue his search, and Anansi left for home. Anansi soon returned to ASO afterward and informed her of his success, then plotted against Osebo the leopard with her. ASO told Anansi to dig a hole to catch Osebo and cover it. However, Anansi caught on to her plan immediately and told her it was enough. Then he went to the place where Osebo normally could be found. Anansi dug a deep pit in the ground, covered it with brushwood, and decided to return home, knowing that Osebo would eventually stumble into the pit as night drew near. Sure enough, Anansi returned to the pit the next morning and found Osebo trapped inside of it. Anansi feigned sympathy and asked the leopard why he was trapped inside. He also asked Osebo if he had been drinking again, something Anansi had constantly warned the leopard about and the spider continued his act, lamenting that he wanted to help Osebo, but was certain that Osebo would attempt to eat him afterward. Osebo insisted that he would not harm Anansi, so the spider agreed to help him. Anansi went aside and cut two long sticks with his knife for the leopard to climb out of the hole with, and told Osebo to stretch his arms wide, secretly leaving the leopard vulnerable. Osebo, unaware of yet another scheme by Anansi, then attempted to scale the stick so that he could escape, but Anansi withdrew his knife again and tossed it at Osebo. The hilt of the knife struck Osebo's head, and the leopard fell down into the pit, now unconscious. Satisfied that his scheme had worked, Anansi gathered some additional sticks and formed a ladder, descending to the bottom of the pit to collect Osebo. Anansi then gloated just as he had before and told the leopard about his bargain with Nayami carrying him away to the Sky God. Anansi then presented Osebo to Nayami when he arrived, and Nayame accepted Anansi's gift. The Sky God, however, was still not convinced that Anansi would succeed in completing his challenge, 
and reminded the spider that he had yet to accomplish all of the tasks he was assigned. The spider returned home another time, deciding to capture Moatia the fairy after some thought. Anansi then decided upon a plan and carved an aqua doll. Next, the spider gathered the sap out of a gum tree, covering it until the aqua doll thus became very sticky, but Anansi was not done. He pounded some mashed yams collected by his wife ASO and covered the aqua doll's hand with it, which Anansi then gathered a basin and placed some mashed yams inside of it. Once he had filled the basin, Anansi then took some of his silk and tied a string around the aqua doll's waist so that he could manipulate it, heading off to the land of fairies once he had finished. Anansi placed the doll in front of an odom tree, a place where fairies often congregated, and sat the basin with the mashed yams in front of it as bait. Anansi then hid behind the odom tree and waited for one of the Moatia to appear. Soon, one came, lured away from her sisters by the mashed yams that the spider had placed in front of the aqua doll. Enticed by the mashed yams, Moasia asked the doll if she could have some of it. Anansi then tugged the aqua doll's waist and it nodded its head in response, which made Moasia excited. Moasia returned to her sisters and asked if they would allow her to eat some, noting that she, completely unaware of Anansi's trickery, had been offered some mashed yams by the aqua doll. Moasia's sisters allowed her to, so the fairy returned to the basin and devoured the mashed yams. When she had finished, Moasia thanked the aqua doll, but Anansi did not tug his string. The aqua doll did not nod to acknowledge Moatia's gratitude. Slightly upset, Moasia told her sisters what had happened, and they advised her to slap the doll's face as recompense. Moasia agreed, and then slapped the aqua doll, but her hand became stuck. Angered, the fairy informed them of what had happened, and another sister suggested that Moesha should slap the doll again, this time with her other hand. The fairy obliged and tried again, only for her remaining hand to become stuck on the gum that covered the aqua doll. Moesha asked her sisters for help a final time, informing them that both her hands were now stuck. Another sister told Moesha to bludgeon the doll with the rest of her body, certain that Moesha would be successful this time in punishing the aqua doll. However, the fairy followed the advice of her sisters and only became stuck to the gum that covered the doll Anansi had laid in front of the odom tree entirely. Anansi then emerged from hiding and used the rest of the string he had tied around his doll to bind Moatia with his string entirely. He then mocked Moatia also, just as he had done to the others he had captured before her and told the fairy of his scheme to offer her Nayami as well. However, Anansi still had another task he wished to complete before he returned to the Sky God. Finally, Anansi headed to his home to visit his mother, Yan Sia, and reminded her of his agreement with the Sky God to exchange her as part of the price for Nayami's stories. Anansi's mother complied with him, and the spider then carried her alongside Moachia to Nayam, presenting both of them to Nayam to complete the bargain for the Sky God's stories. Nayami accepted both of them, thoroughly impressed at the success of the spider, and assembled a meeting within his kingdom. The Sky God summoned his elders, the Kuntaire and Aquam chiefs, the Adontem general of his army's main body, the Gyase, the Oyoko, Ankobia, and finally Ki Dom, who led his rear guard. Niame then told them about the task Anansi had accomplished when none else, not even the greatest kingdoms, could afford his stories. Niame recounted each of the creatures Anansi had presented the Sky God with, as well as his own mother, Yansia, and allowed his audience to see each of these gifts for themselves. Niame finally acknowledged Anansi's talents and told the spider he now had the Sky God's blessings. The people rejoiced alongside Niame, as he then announced that his stories would no longer be known by his name or belong to him. From then on, the Sky God stories would belong to Anansi, and all of them would be known as spider stories for eternity. So it is that every story, no matter the subject or theme, is called a spider story. Now it is worth noting that there are many variants of this tale, 
with other retellings like Haley's omitting ASO and Yansia. Other variants include a Caribbean version, Moashia being portrayed as a relatively solitary fairy capable of turning invisible, and another version that does not require Anansi to capture the Python Onini. Although he is often regarded as a prophet in Akan spirituality, his followers do not recognize him as such. Instead, they honor him as a healer, a symbol of wisdom and a creator of the first human body. Instead of being a symbol of resistance, he was often regarded as a symbol of survival. This is because he used his cunning and trickery to turn the tables on his oppressors. Stories of Anansi helped enslaved Africans establish a sense of continuity within their lives, which allowed them to assert their identity within the confines of captivity. Stories of Anansi were exclusively part of an oral tradition, and he was regarded as having the most wisdom and skill in speech. This tradition eventually encompassed various kinds of fables, and tales were also introduced to the rest of the world through the slaves who were brought to the New World by the Atlantic slave trade. As Jamaica had the largest concentration of enslaved Ashanti in the Americas, they tend to have much better documented stories and proverbs. He was referred to as Kwaku Anansi, even during times of slavery. This is because the Akan word for Anansi is Kwaku. Anansi's role in the lives of Africans goes far beyond slavery. He has also evolved into a figure who is regarded as a classical hero. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this to come. Take care, and I'll see you in the next myth.